Welcome to another podcast for Talking Irish, the first of our new season. And uh, we did a number of podcasts last year to, to see how we would uh, work out with it. It worked out fairly well, so we're going to be doing at least one uh, each week for the season. Uh, maybe two, a preview for each game and a follow-up after each win. We're going to look at the upcoming season as a whole this week. Now that we've gotten through our spring workouts, our summer programs, and now uh, pretty much summer camps wrapping up with one week to go. I uh, went down to Shamrock Jacks on Saturday, watched Strong and True for the spring practice, see what they did out at uh, Camp Shiloh if you didn't see it. I'm sure you can find it online. Let's start off by taking a quick and very brief re- uh, year in review for last year. Um, very hard to finish up 12-0 and and still have a chip on your shoulder, but after the beating the Irish took at the hands of the Crimson Tide last year in the BCS Championship game, I think a lot of teams would like to have gone 12-0 and and still be able to have uh, some solid motivation and a little bit of a chip on the shoulder as, as the Irish do this year. So I think even though uh, it was a great season, there's obviously still room for growth. We haven't reached the uh, promised land as of yet with another national championship. We've definitely reached the goal of, of competing for one. But uh, let's start moving forward and, and let's take a look, uh, make some comparisons to last year, but definitely move forward. First and foremost, they get starts and finishes at the quarterback position, and there's no ands, ifs, or buts. We know Tommy Reese is going to be our starting quarterback come next Saturday against the Temple Owls. Last year, there might have been some speculation. Uh, there was definitely a quarterback controversy in terms of who should start, uh, but uh, there's there's definitely no controversy this year. Now the question will be, will Tommy Reese be the starting quarterback week two and throughout the season? Uh, obviously my hope is yes. Definitely a lot of people are a little concerned, maybe even upset that Tommy Reese is going to be our starting quarterback, but uh, I think there's a lot of pros to that. You're talking about a guy with a lot of game experience and a lot of starts and quite frankly a lot of wins. Uh, the big piece that uh, people will point out is big numbers in turnovers, which is kind of strange to me because you're talking about a quarterback who seems to have a good head for the game. He's projected to be a coach down the line. He's a heady player. He's a son of a coach. But, but just he just doesn't seem to make it where he's work on the field when it comes down to turnovers. But at the same time, I think a lot of teams would like to be in our position to have this much experience under center heading into a, a season where your starter from last year isn't eligible to play. So, like it or not, Tommy Reese is going to be under center come next Saturday. And uh, the loss of Golson doesn't really matter till come spring. So let's look at the other quarterbacks on the roster, at least the, the ones in scholarship. Hendricks is a, it, it probably could be playing quarterback in a lot of other schools right now, or at least seeing some game time in regards to um, you know meaningful time as opposed to mop-up detail or, or two years ago against Stanford. However, uh, he just hasn't been able to break through the two deep, and a lot of that's been, oh, other players that have come in that were there before him have come in after that have just kind of bumped him and stuck him at third, and he's kind of stayed there. You know, he's a decent-sized kid at 6'2", over 200 pounds. He shows he can run. Uh, Arm strength is decent, but just doesn't have a lot of game experience, although the word coming out of camp is he's really starting to master the position, whereas even he has admitted that, you know, in the past he's kind of relied a little bit on his athleticism or his just experience of being a quarterback. And, well, quite frankly, he's feeling he's doing a lot better. So if he does have to step in, maybe we'll have a pleasant surprise. Although I think most people are looking towards Malik Zaire, true freshman, to um, redshirt initially, but now he may have to be the number two guy, even if the the chart says Hendricks. Zaire is a left-hander, supposedly Golson point two, and um, has played very well, including the touch the only touchdown pass in the spring game, in the blue and gold game this spring. So, um, quite frankly, Zaire may need to burn a year of eligibility just to get meaningful reps. Because next year he may be the only scholarship player with any kind of experience on the team. With Hendricks being a pre-med, not sure he'll be back. Reese will be out of eligibility. And I don't know that it's 100% that Golson makes his way back. So uh, 
ideally, in a perfect world, Zaire saves a year of eligibility, but uh, at the same time, he may need to get some game experience. So at the quarterback position, it is what it is, and I think our backups um, are going to be as, as solid as they can be. Hopefully that we will not see them in any meaningful time. Meaningful time. I think it all comes back down to Brian Kelly. Um, is he is he our future? Is he our present? After a couple eight and five years, looking like a mediocre coach in terms of the record books, uh, he had obviously had a breakout year, and uh, I think a lot of that has to do with his coaching staff. And there's a lot of high-profile guys in terms of assistance when you look at um, Bob Diaco, defensive coordinator, who won assistant coach of the year last year. And that's not too bad. Chuck Martin, offensive coordinator, has got a, some looks as well. And quite frankly, you know, there, there's a lot of guys on this this coaching staff and this the staff that Kelly's got that have pretty good reputations for not even being assistant head coaches or offensive or defensive coordinators. You have a, a strength and conditioning coach in Paul Longo who uh, has got uh, the world in terms of people thinking he's great in terms of what he can do in strength and conditioning, and he has. Even their uh, equipment manager, uh, Ryan Grooms, has got a, a pretty good Twitter following. But, of course, you know there, there's a number of other coaches, um, Tony Alfred, and um, uh, there, there's just a lot of guys in there that could probably step up and, and be head coaches at a smaller school somewhere else but are staying in South Bend to be part of something special. So I, I think the, the coaching staff has done a good job. Uh, over the last couple of years, and hopefully has done a good job keeping this team grounded at the same time building their confidence. That's a, a tough balancing act. The one thing I do want to talk about with Kelly is there's something I boy, j- really just last week noticed was missing from his vocabulary. He really and really talked about the process and uh, the fact that he does not um, has not talked about that this year. And I don't know if that's a different focus this year, but it just that seemed to be the word over and over again, the process, the process. And quite frankly, not even being sure what that meant always, uh, he was able to use that motivation to get his team undefeated. So maybe it's a different focus this year. Maybe the process is so ingrained uh, in his team and his staff that that's just something that's looked at a little bit differently. But it was just something that kind of stuck out to me. But Overall, the coaching staff is intact, the coaching staff is experienced, and definitely respected by the players. So I don't think there's going to be any problems with the staff being able to communicate the goals for this year. And, of course, the goals for this year have to be uh, an undefeated season up to and including a national championship for the Irish. I don't expect them to necessarily um, go undefeated to win a national championship, but in today's world, you, you almost have to. So I think between the coaching staff and the players, I think they, they should be focused enough. Moving on to the players, we've talked about the quarterback position. We need to look at the running back position. Quite frankly, this is a position with a lot of talent, a lot of potential, <laughs> And a lot of people striving to see the field. We've got nobody with a ton of game experience. There's no clear-cut leader in terms of a starting running back. However, most people would argue, and I'd have to agree, that George Atkinson will probably be the number one back. He's got the great combination of size and speed. Uh, and he could run between the tackles. I know everyone talks about the Calabrese hit in the blue and gold game. I think he's learned to lower his shoulders. I don't think that's going to be a problem in the near future. Uh, Cam McDaniel, uh, I think he's another running back that's got some experience that should see the field on some regular basis. He's proved that he's a tough kid and that he can run the ball. Uh, He does lack some size and and overall speed, but, boy, he can run that ball, especially uh, for the tough yards. So I'm looking for those two two individuals to really lead the running back uh, group in terms of whether it be coaching amongst the players or just running the ball. There's a lot of, uh, I'll use the term, new talent coming in, even though we have a couple people that have years of experience. And Amir Carlisle transferred from USC, who's you know been fighting the injury bug. And uh, William Mahone, who is a sophomore coming back, who didn't get any game playing time last year. So both of those are poised to, to maybe have breakout years. Carlisle 
if you haven't seen any film on this kid, and obviously it hasn't been a lot because of his injuries, going back to a short time at USC and his high school film, this kid's an athlete, and he's put on some weight in the last year, and he could be a real dangerous weapon. I'd like to see him come out of the slot. William Mahone, who really, quite frankly, I think a lot of people are questioning whether he was going to be around come this fall because of the logjam, if you will, of, of talent back there. And, you know, his drive has really shown in spring, and his coaches are raving about him, has done very well to prepare for the fall. However, we will not see him in the first game. He's got a high ankle sprain, and those injuries are, are tricky at best. So I would be very surprised if we even see him suited up against Temple, but I will expect to see him throughout this year uh, trying to make an impact. Of course, there's two super freshmen and Bryant and Folston. I think a lot of people are going to pick Bryant to be the lead person to really push Atkins in terms of the every down back. He is a physical specimen when it comes down to having somebody come out of the backfield. Really good size, good speed. I think a lot of people knock his speed because it's not great which it is not, but it's very good. And Volson's an all-around back, and I see him catching passes out of the backfield, and I think he could also contribute right away. I think the question is going to come down to, can some of the returning running backs get the momentum to to be leaders on the field and be every game backs, or do Brian and Folson have to step up, have to play, or will they redshirt? So there's a lot of questions at running back, but the good news is there's a lot of answers. Another position that we see a very similar, lot of talent, but not sure who's going to take the, the lead, is at the wide receiver position. The money's on incumbent T.J. Jones and Troy Nicholas at tight end to probably lead that based on their experience. Brian Kelly is very high on T.J. Jones, believing that he is a, a true uh, All-American type receiver. It could definitely use a little height. Uh, speed's good. His route skills are fantastic, and he's got very good hands. So he's got a lot in his toolbox to, to warrant those accolades from Coach Kelly. He just has to go out and prove it. Troy Nicholas is following in the footsteps of some great tight ends at Notre Dame, which has been known as tight end U recently. Uh, Troy started off on defense his freshman year, switched over last year, as you know, to, to tight end and played behind and aside uh, Eifert, who went on to the NFL this year. And he's just a man child at six foot seven, two sixty plus. He's he's learning the position of tight end. He's, he's his hands are improving. I would expect him to obviously not be the tight end that we've seen in Eifert and maybe Rudolph in the past, but I think he's going to develop into his own special type of tight end in South Bend. So those are the two that I think we're going to look to early to take the lead. But make no mistake about it, there's a, a number of people that have, are waiting for their turn, and, or maybe we're waiting for them to, to step up. One is Dan Smith. Of course, there's Devaris Daniels and Chris Brown at the receiver position. Uh, Dan Smith's got some size. Uh, he's a senior, and he's going to need to definitely, this is uh, for him uh, almost his last chance to really show what he can do because there's a lot of people willing to, to, to step up. Devaris Daniels has been showing some talent. Of course, Chris Brown is, is our speaker. Speed man, but just not any um, body of work to, to speak of. At the tight end position, Ben Koyak and Alex Welch have been underachieving, disappointing to say the least over the last couple of years. Some of that due to injury, some of it just due to lack of opportunity, and, and some of it, quite frankly, is on their own in terms of just not stepping up. But they both appear to be healthy and ready to go to run either a two or even a three tight end set for the Irish and uh, help Troy out in the tight end position. There are a number, well, let's sticking on the tight end, there's a couple of freshmen and Mike Hireman and uh, Durham Smith who, again, uh, similar to maybe the running back situation, should red shirt to save a year continue to add some strength and conditioning, but uh, quite frankly, you're probably as good enough as any freshman coming in at the tight end position in the college football to see the field. So the only time will tell if they'll play. At the wide receiver position, there's a ton of young talent looking to come in. 
And um, uh, Torrey Hunter, I know, is a little bit slower on his rehab. Torrey Hunter Jr., uh, Corey Robinson, I would be very surprised to not see this field uh, this season based on his, his what he's done in practice. He's catching everything. His height, obviously, is, is a strength. A lot of people talking red zone, fade patterns in the corner of the end zone. But I think he's going to develop into an all-around fantastic wide receiver. William Fuller's got a chance to step up. Um, uh, Procise CJ is going to have a chance as coming into a sophomore year, and there's just a, a lot of talent there. Uh, the the one wild card I'll throw out at the receiver position is uh, senior Luke Massa. At six foot four, he's he ties for the tallest receiver that we have outside of tight ends. And at two thirty seven, again out of tight end uh, outside of tight ends, he's our heaviest receiver. He came to South Bend as a quarterback, but. <laughs> That wasn't going to happen for a number of reasons, and after his first year, switched over to the receiver position, it just has not seen the field. So that'll be interesting to see if his size and his experience will step in and get him on the field this year. Our offensive line is, uh, especially on one side, probably as good as any in the nation. Uh, Zach Martin leads the the way as a graduate student uh, tight end or tight end uh, offensive tackle. He probably could play tight end if he wanted to. He could probably play anywhere. He's the, the captain of this team. He's the leader of the offensive line, and, and he will definitely make it a lot easier for Tommy Reese, who is not going to be a huge threat to run like Golson, but he's going to give him more time. Next to him, Chris Watt. Uh, another fifth-year senior. Uh, those two are next to each other are going to be fantastic. I think that's a great one and two punch that, no matter who's running the ball, is going to have some opportunities to get some yardage. Along with those two, Christian Lombard's coming back to play along the the offensive line. Looks like Nick Martin, Zach's younger brother, is going to come in at at uh, at center. And there's a number of players. I think Ronnie Stanley. Um, there's a number of guys that could play the round out that the best five, as Kelly's always said. But uh, Ronnie, Stan- Ronnie Stanley is big, he's quick, he's strong. Uh, he's been low banged up this, this summer, but I, I expect him to definitely be starting along that line. The offensive line looks really good down the down the road with a fantastic incoming freshman class. And I think you're going to see someone like Steve Elmer play right away. Uh, traditionally, I... Not a big fan of uh, freshman playing, but especially on the offensive line, that's you have to know a lot of uh, a lot of football to play there at the college level. And uh, Brian Kelly says it over and over again: Elmer can play anywhere on the offensive line in college today. So I would expect to see him sooner than later. Defensively. There's a lot of talk with Manti Teo's departure, but the fact of the matter is the the bread and butter is still the defensive line, and, and uh, there's a lot of talent coming back in the starting roles. Obviously, at Knicks and to it, that's that's pretty easy, and that's that's we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about them. We know how good they are and what they can do. Uh, Sheldon Day has continued to impress coaches and his, his teammates, and will take the other defensive end position on the other side of to it. That's not going to be a, a big surprise there. However, there are some injuries on the other on the defensive line as well that are pretty much season-ending. We'll talk more about injuries in a little bit. But Tony Springman and Chase Hounshell are out for the season, so that hurts the defensive end depth. But uh, along the line, uh, Kona Schwenke has shown that he can play. He He's going to back up Knicks, and he'll probably be able to give Knicks the breaks he needs, although Knicks' goal is to play more. Uh, I, on the, again, on the defensive line, I expect Jerron Jones, sophomore, uh, who redshirted last year, he's going to have to step up and play with the loss of Springman and, and Hounshell at the defensive end position. He needs, he's going to need to be able to back up the defensive ends. Uh, so freshman Isaac Rochelle is probably going to end up seeing the field this year. Soon or later, he's, he's been playing well in practice, and they just need some more depth, and he's the type of player that can um, However, there's two two guys in the linebacking crew who can put their hand on the on the ground and and come off the end at not necessarily a, a defensive end position, but can if needed. And that's Prince Shembo and Ishak Williams. They can definitely come and and put pressure on the quarterback in different roles. Not that they'd play necessarily a regular defensive end position, although there has been some talk for Ishak Williams to do so. Uh, I think you're going to see more of that as kind of a flex position where as as the offense lines up. They may not know exactly where he's going to be till he he kind of either puts his hands on the ground or doesn't. 
inside linebackers. We're going to talk about Fox and Calabrese a lot. They're going to see the field a lot, although they're probably going to platoon at their position. Jarek Race is going to take over uh, Manti's spot. There's probably going to be some rotation with all three around in regards to um, the inside linebacker positions. Obviously, Dan Fox has got a little bit better of a of a pass coverage. Calabrese is fantastic against the run, and Jarek Grace has been playing some good ball. So it'll be exciting to see how that plays out. Um, in terms of our uh, other linebackers, Kendall Moore and Ben Council, there's been a lot of talk about Ben needing to play more now that Danny Spond is out. So there's some t- opportunities for them to, to step up. There's some breakthrough players as well. Um, freshman Michael Deeb might even see some time. I like this kid on film. I expect him to redshirt almost no matter what, but I like this kid. Jalen Smith, like Ben Council, will be probably seeing the field a lot sooner than later and very meaningful snaps because of the loss of Danny Spahn. So expect to see uh, some different linebacking rotations this this season. And not just early on while things are being felt out, but definitely throughout the, the season, seeing some meaningful time from a lot of different players. And that's not because we don't have one good players because we have many good players which is fantastic one of the areas last year that was a big concern mostly because of injuries was the defensive secondary this year not much of a concern compared to last year and that's led by senior captain Bennett Jackson at the cornerback position and also junior um, Matthias Farley playing safety. They're coming back this year, and I, I expect those two to be the, the leaders. Um, of course, Bennett Jackson was named a captain. Matthias Farley, I still think, is a great story because he didn't start playing organized football to, until his junior year of of high school, and I just get a kick out of that. And I just uh, I think he's an athlete, and an athlete is an athlete. Uh, so with those two, they got some good supporting uh, casts and sophomore um, Tavari Russell, who, as many of you know, literally the week before the season was shifted from, or right before the season started, was shifted from running back as a true freshman to the defensive side of the ball, where he started and got burnt early in the Navy game and never looked back and pretty much just did fantastic at, at, in the defensive backfield for us. There's a lot of people that are going to be coming in that will be fighting for some time. But again, I think similar to some of the linebacking positions, it's not because there's not one particular good person, but there's enough talent to go around uh, in Low Wood, Austin Collinsworth, um, Elijah Shoemate, and even freshman Max Redfield. I think the, the word on him is he's just too talented to keep off the field whether he's needed or not may even be irrelevant it's just he's that good uh, and again that's good news to have that kind of talent for us the kicking game i think is still up in the air a little bit i think kyle brenza is still who you're looking at as, as a junior coming back to to be the main place kicker and kickoffs punting is still up in the air and i think if i recall brian kelly last week basically said they're going to use the tempo game to really feel that out a little bit more and which i find is interesting and i hate we'll talk about tempo later in the week but i know you might want to call it a tune-up game i you always get nervous when coaches are going to use a game to see how things go as opposed to knowing ahead of time. Again, in uh, special teams, uh, long snapper, which is a very interesting position now because a lot of teams, including Notre Dame, are giving full scholarships to true freshmen as a long snapper. And, uh, Scott Daly is coming in who is going to replace Jordan Cowart, who was a four-year starter uh, as a long snapper. So uh, the special teams is, is going to be okay in the kicking game. The return game... Is, is a question mark. Two years ago, George Atkinson was uh, had some early heroics with two touchdown returns on kickoffs. Last year slowed down the pace a little bit. We all know the this the terrible terrible numbers of the punt return game. I believe it was forty two percent of the time last year punt returns resulted in fair catches. That's that, that's pretty sad, and I think it'd have been more if if that was just the standard piece. And I think if if uh, teams playing against the Irish were smart, they probably would have played things a little bit differently because the, I think the standard practice was fair catch, protect the ball, as opposed to mount any kind of return. It looks like on kickoff returns, George Atkinson will be back, and it'll be very interesting to see how 
he does in his third year after a great freshman campaign at kickoff return. T.J. Jones, it looks like, is going to be fielding punt returns, which initially concerns me because if that's going to be your number one receiver, putting him at punt return could open up some opportunities for injuries, but he wants to do it. He seems to be doing well and obviously could do no worse than anybody that's that's out there. Rounding out our conversation, just looking at the entire season, uh, the injury bug, like most teams, has definitely hit the Irish as hard as anybody. Uh, there's a list that I'm looking at here, and, and some are worse than others. And we'll start with Danny Spond, whose career is now over. Uh, he had migraines that kept him out of some action early last year. He came back, had a great season, and it looked like he was on track to start again for the Irish in the fall. And apparently there's some medical issues that this football is not going to be happening. He is going to be staying with the team, traveling with the team, and, and Brian Kelly's word, coaching with the team. And as I think Brian Kelly said, who better than, than someone like Danny Spahn who, who knows the who knows the, the the position and knows his teammates. Uh, Torrey Hunter Jr. had, had a, a collarbone or shoulder injury. Uh, I apologize. No, that was a leg injury uh, that has not uh, healed as quite as fast. Again, this is not somebody who needs to play. Um, I know Dan Smith's been out receiver with some no contact, but he's supposed to be playing. Freshman linebacker uh, Doug Randolph is out for the season. He's having shoulder surgery, uh, similar to Nicky Barati, who's also out for the season with a shoulder injury. Uh, we mentioned earlier William Mahone is uh, nursing a high ankle sprain which uh, will probably put him out of the Temple game. Tony Sprigman is out for the season with a right knee, and I'm continuously hearing very severe, very severe, very severe, which makes me wonder, is he coming back uh, in, in the spring? Because knee injuries, to me, always seem to be um, questionable in regards to uh, how those will play out in the long run. So the best luck to, to Tony, because Tony can play from the defensive end or the defensive tackle position. And, of course, Chase Hounshell was also out for the season with a second shoulder injury, and it's the same shoulder that kept him out in the past. And this young man had a great freshman campaign in regards to, you know, as much as time as he could see as a freshman, really having some great plays. And the future looked real bright for him, but it just has not turned out well in terms of, uh, his health. So we wish all those guys a speedy recovery, and hopefully that there's a, there's other bangs and bruises. I know uh, freshman offensive tackle Mike McGinchy uh, had some bumps and bruises, and um, there's a couple other guys who have been in and out of pads during the fall. But uh, I, I don't think there's anything that's on the radar that I'm aware of. This is not an end all be all list. This will grow through the season. Hopefully they will be few and far between and that we will not have to worry about losing other players for the season. Uh, there's a couple positions that we could probably get away with. Uh, defensive line, in my opinion, is not one of those. I just cannot see them um, getting any thinner. They just don't have the, the starting three are fantastic after that. It, it, after too deep, it, it gets inexperienced real quick. Uh, this, this season, going 12-0 and is going to be a challenge for a number of reasons. I don't know if uh, most people think they can do it again. I think looking at the schedule, uh, they could. Last year, I had a, a, a prediction that they could go as they could win as little as six games and win as many as ten or eleven. I'm not sure I'm going to make any bold statements of of records this year. But taking a quick look, you know, there's ones they should win, shouldn't win. Could loss. I think we're, we're pretty much on the same page. Temple should definitely be a win. Uh, if, if, they, if, if any loss to Temple happens, uh, I think there would be major concern in South Bend on a number of levels. Uh, at Michigan, last time they played at Michigan at night, they broke a record uh, attendance record for NCAA football. I would anticipate it's going to be a very similar situation in Ar Ann Arbor uh, this year. That's a game that we definitely need to win for a number of reasons. Temple, we should be 1-0. Michigan will be a tough challenge. A new quarterback coming in for them. And this is a big rivalry, and Notre Dame needs to get momentum moving quickly. But that should be a win. At Purdue, we're going to knock that off as a win. Michigan State in South Bend, 
I would expect that to be a win, although not a give me, but definitely a win. And then Oklahoma is coming to visit Notre Dame on the 28th of September, and this is maybe next to Michigan in the first half of their season, their biggest game. Oklahoma is looking good. They have not tipped their hat as to who their starting quarterback is going to be. Uh, Money's on uh, Bell, the Bell Dozer, in terms of a big running quarterback. Uh, We'll see. I don't see a two-quarterback system there. Uh, Oklahoma's a good team, but I like that as a win. Uh, The next game is part of the Shamrock Series, which is uh, in Arlington, Texas, at the Cowboys Stadium against Arizona State. A lot of people are seeing this as some sort of trap game. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I don't really buy into them. If they can beat Oklahoma and they come into that game being 5-0, and um, I, I think they would be well enough grounded to not fall into that trap, so I like that as a win. Then USC comes to town, and another night game. USC is not the USC of all. This should be, I don't think they've uh, selected a starter or a quarterback either, but this should definitely be a win. Air Force on the road. Again, the the military, always, the armed forces always play us tough, but I can't see anything but a Notre Dame win there. Uh, then we have Navy, which should be a win. Then at Pittsburgh, which should be a win. BYU in South Bend, which is, uh, again, I think somebody else would call that a trap game, but I like our chances there. And then wrapping up at Stanford on the 30th of uh, November. At that point, the Irish could be undefeated, and that could be a huge matchup. I think Stanford and their team will remember the goal line stance and some controversy and and believe that they owe the Irish some payback. That could be the make-or-break game for a either 12-0 season or if there's one or two losses in there, uh, a trip to the BCS, uh, BCS ball. And because three losses will you will not get into a BCS ball uh, at that level. So if they have two coming into that game, that would make or break their opportunity for that as well. So twelve and zero is is maybe now out of the question. I think it's going to be tough. I think there's a number of teams that could beat the Irish. Like you know Michigan, Oklahoma, and Stanford are probably the the top three that you know, could definitely have three losses there. In terms of the second tier of, of, of teams that could take them out, I think Michigan State always plays the Irish tough. USC plays them tough. I, that, I wouldn't even put them in a, a second tier. I, I, see, I would mark that as a win. I'd say maybe Arizona State and BYU. So there's six potential losses there in there. I think there's three reasonable losses in Stanford, Michigan, and Oklahoma. And I think there's another possible losses if they're not careful against teams like, uh, again, Arizona State and BYU and, and maybe even Michigan State. So there's there's some trip-up opportunities there to, to get three losses. So heading into the season, I like where we're going. I'm pretty impressed with what the coaches have done. Obviously, we will not know how certain things will play out until next Saturday. Um, hopefully, everyone will get a chance to either tune in. That's a 3.30 Eastern time start. Uh, I know I'll be at Shamrock Jacks. Uh, their tailgate starts in Rondequoit at 2 o'clock, I believe, and they always put on a good tailgate. Looking forward to that. I'd highly recommend getting over there for the Reuben. I had one yesterday. Uh, Thursday afternoons uh, till 4, they have a great lunch special of $10, a Reuben, and a Guinness. I think you can substitute for a harp, but stick with the Guinness. And we'll, we'll be back later this week, hopefully with another podcast with a preview for Temple. Until then, go Irish. And